Hello. Lots of people. Too much. Too much people. Um, first of all, thanks, Pavel, for, for the laptop. Mine is broken, so <laughs> thanks a lot. Introduction to TensorFlow. OK, let's start with a question. What is this? It's a cat. Yeah, that was an easy question. But is that easy for a computer? You know, a computer is a machine that makes computations, that thinks with mathematical operations. So the real question is, is there a mathematical relationship between this input, an image of a cat, and the target a class cat? And the answer is yes, but it's very complex. And we're going to learn this complex relationship using tons of examples. And this, learning a very complex relationship using tons of examples, is a fairly well first definition of deep learning. And you know, we're here in Rimini at EuroPython 2017. We love Python. So we want to make deep learning with Python. And what is the best tool for that? It's TensorFlow. So what is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is an open source library uh, for deep learning. It's uh, mainly used in Python, and it was released by the Google Brain project two years ago. Um, but the first, the, the 100 version was not launched until February of this year. So installation, quickly. Um, the best practice is to download Anaconda and then create a new environment uh, with the classic data science libraries and then there, pip install TensorFlow. For Windows, it's the same, but without the source world, okay? Concepts. Now we enter the most important part of the talk, the concepts, because TensorFlow could be a difficult tool for beginners if you don't understand the basic concepts of deep learning and how TensorFlow works. So, Recall this, we have the cat, the image of a cat, and we have the class cat. And we want to find the mathematical relationship between these two. That mathematical relationship, we call it the model. And this model is going to make uh, predictions uh, given the input. Sometimes, at first, it's going to be random predictions. Sometimes you could say it's a cat, and sometimes you could say it's a non-cat. Um, well, so we have the input, the image of a cat, and we have the model that is going to make predictions given the input, and we have the target that is the correct class for that image. And the prediction should match the target, but it doesn't. So what, we, what we're going to do is to change the model so it gets better and the predictions match the targets. So the first, step, the first step for this is to compute the difference between the prediction and the target. And this is going to be done by the cost function or loss function. Um, this cost function is going to produce an error. And this error is like, how far are we from having a good model? The, the greater the error, the greater we have to, the more we have to change the model. So we're going to learn from errors. That's life, learning from errors. Sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And the guy, finally, the guy in, in charge of changing the model, of training the model, is the optimizer. Okay, so this is the basic, the basic structure of a learning process in deep learning. And this is what TensorFlow calls the graph. And the graph is just 
layout which contains both the model and the learning, the learning process. Okay, so the graph, it's totally independent from the data, but there is really, there is really a connection with the data. So, because the graph is nothing without data, we couldn't have predictions without input data, and we couldn't have um, learning without targets. So, we set two gates that are gonna, one gate is for the inputs and one gate is for the targets, and these gates are gonna let the data to come in, but not all types of data, only the data that we want. So in this case, we want images for inputs and classes for targets. These gates are called placeholders. Well, quick summary of what a graph contains, and well, there is a green board there, variables, because the model is just a set of variables, and we're gonna vary these variables. We're gonna change these variables to make the model better. And keep this word in mind because TensorFlow uses it. Well, we have, uh, we have the graph with the placeholders, but we want the data to come into the graph. So what we do is to open a TensorFlow session. And, well, when we're in a TensorFlow session, we say we're feeding the graph with data. Okay, so, example, um, we have this cat, this cat goes through the model, and the model say, it's a known cat. And that's not correct, so the cost function say, we have an error of 100. The optimizer reads this uh, error and say, we need to train the model, and we train the model. In other case, we have the cat, and the model says it's a cat, so the cost is zero, and the optimizer does nothing. Well, that's, that's the, the main part of the, the, of the talk, but we're gonna see several cases of use uh, in order to um, stay with the concepts, okay? So learn the concepts better. Mm, it couldn't be otherwise, the, the, the first thing we're gonna do is a hello world. Not really a hello world because we're not gonna print hello world, we're gonna uh, add two integers. And the first thing is to import TensorFlow, this is the convention, import it as TF, and this is the graph we're gonna build. We have two placeholders, one for one integer and the other for the other integer, and the addition operation. So, and this is the code. We set the placeholders that it's gonna uh, expect integers, and we have the, the addition operation that is like a function of TensorFlow, and that's the graph. And independently, there's the data. We have number one, there is three, number two, there is eight. And this is the session. The session is something that you open and you close, so we use the with keyword, and we, we're gonna run the, the sum operation, and now we're gonna feed the graph, feed, with a dictionary that links each placeholders with uh, each data. So this is the output for a Jupyter notebook, and we see how it works. Three and eight is 11, so perfect. But this is kind of boring, because we're not learning. And uh, how can we make this thing more interesting? The next case is gonna be a regression problem, and in, you know you're in a regression problem when your outputs are not classes, like cat, dog, fish, you have output, there are numbers, like two, minus three, 6.7, number pi, square root of two, that kind of thing. And our case is to learn how to sum. So what we're gonna do is to uh, take 
two inputs and an output, and we're gonna uh, learn the mathematical relationship um, using 10,000 examples. So these are the examples, and we can see clearly that the, the first, the, the, the integers sum up to 13, so we see, we are, we are seeing the relationship. So this is kind of silly, that, you know, uh, in a regression problem, you always have the same philosophy. So we're now learning how to sum, but say we are in a self-driving car, the first input would be like an image taken from the camera in front of the vehicle, and the second input would be the distance taken from a laser in front of the vehicle. And the output is the angle you need to steer the vehicle to not crash or not uh, get out of the lane. But we're gonna keep with the addition example. So what we're gonna assume is that the relationship between the output and the input is, the, is a linear function that is an addition and a multiplication. So these are the variables we're gonna learn. We're gonna be, we're gonna be changing this variable so it gets better. And in this case, we're okay with a linear function. But if we wanted to learn a more complex relationship, we just had to um, add another linear function, add another layer. And if we wanted to make it even more complex, we stack another layer. And if we want to make it even more complex, we add nonlinear functions or activation functions. So that's a neural network, okay? Easy. Um, well, it's the code. We, we said the placeholders. We're expecting floats. And we're expecting two numbers two integers for the inputs and one for the output. And the known is because we don't know how many examples are we gonna receive. So we don't restrict that number. Okay, the model is just the two variables. We initialize it um, randomly and we make the linear function with the multiplication and the addition. Well, so we have the placeholders and we have the model. Next thing is the cast function. The cast function uh, computes the difference between the prediction and the, and the target. So the most intuitive thing is to uh, make the difference. Um, but what we're gonna do is to uh, get rid of negative numbers. So we uh, square it all and then we sum it all, sum all the, all, the, all the errors from all the examples and reduce it to one number. Okay, so this is the code we need. We square it, we make the difference, square it, and reduce the sum. Well, let's say that our cost function is, can be plotted like this, and, and well, the, the the higher the red things that are more error and the down peak is the minimum we want to reach. What we're gonna do is, let's say we have an error of 10 and we're gonna get down to the down peak. So we're gonna take the direction of maximum steep, that is the gradient. And we follow that direction again and again until we reach the minimum. This is the code, TensorFlow gives you a model of gradient descent, and there's a hyperparameter, there is learning rate, and that is like um, the module of the arrow. So you could, you could have a graded arrow, and then you, you could reach the minimum faster, but maybe you pass by the minimum and you oscillate by the minimum, even going unstable. And if you have a, um, an arrow that is smaller, maybe you don't reach the minimum because it's too slow. Okay, we minimize the cost and we have it all, but we 
need the data. What we're going to do with the data is typical of machine learning, that is, um, you uh, split the data in two, one for training and one for testing, and the training is what we're going to use. So I built helper functions for this, so we don't have to bother off about the data. That's for another talk. And the session. OK. Um, in the session, we're going to feed the graph with the training data. So let's do it. First thing, we mm, start an initializer of the variables, and then we run the optimizer. Running the optimizer, you're going to uh, learn and we feed it with the training, the training data, and we run all the training data. A lot of times, that mm, when you run the data one time, you say that's an epoch. So we have this for loop that's gonna uh, train the the neural network uh, numbers of time. Okay, that's that's the epoch, and we see that we have an accuracy of. 95% and then the sum of 5 plus 7 is, is almost 12. But if we take a look to the weights, that's not a sum. A sum is just 1, 1 and the bias 0. That means that we have overfitted the neural network to just make good summation for our data. Okay, now a classification problem. In a classification problem, um, you're not gonna use numbers, you're gonna use classes. So we have a, we have a cat that could be a class cat, and we have another thing that could be a class non-cat. But cat and non-cat are words. We don't work with words. We don't work with words. So we just transform it. Um, transform it in a way that a class is a component of an array, in this case, a cat is like the second component of the array, and the non-cat is the first component of the array. This is called one hot encoding. And this 0, 1, 1, 0 is just for targets. But what could be our predictions? Our predictions could be uh, probabilities. And sometimes the model is going to be very sure that the that the input belongs to a certain class. In this case, we have the cat that in the model is 80, 82% sure that it's a cat. But sometimes we're not going to be that sure, but the summation is going to be one. OK. Um, well, our case now is going to be um, uh, learn. We have two integers, we're going to sum it and we're going to classify it if they are uh, greater than 10 or lesser than 10. If they are greater, we're going to say that belongs to the second class and they are lesser, it's going to belong to the first class. This is a silly example, but it works and it's, it's good for learning. So this relationship is more complex than the than than the before. So we need other layer. And interestingly, the first layer is going to compute the sum, and the second layer is going to classify that sum into greater than 10 or lesser than 10. And this uh, is going to happen always in all classification problems. The first layers are going to extract more basic features, more basic information, and the next layers are going to work uh, with this basic information to produce even more complex information. So uh, and we, we stack a softmax, uh, a nonlinear function at the end, because we want that the output uh, are probabilities that sum up to one. So, okay, we have built the model, and in this case, in the cost function, we're not going to use uh, the cost function of before. We're going to use a cross entropy cost function um, that is beyond of this talk. And the optimizer, we're going to use a uh, better optimizer, that is Adam optimizer, that 
works a lot better because uh, it goes changing the learning rate. You don't, so at first it's going to be a big learning rate and then it's going to be uh, smaller. So these are the results. We have a testing accuracy of 100. So that's, that's bad. We have done something bad. But, but it works. Uh, five plus three is the model is 89%, that is lesser than 10. And seven plus six is 87%, that is sure that is uh, greater than 10, and the same for 10 plus 10. And we, we see how in the first layer it's like a sum, but it's with a negative. And in the second layer, it's the same number in the weights, but with a negative in one of them. That, that's going to classify the output of the, of the first layer. So, OK, that's all. But uh, if you want to know more, uh, I recommend you to uh, follow the Neural Networks and Deep Learning book from Michael Nielsen and the Stanford CS231N from Andrei Karpathy. You're going to learn a lot. Uh, and for TensorFlow, there's a lot of tutorials about TensorFlow, but I thought that they missed the basics. That's why I did this talk. OK, if you, uh, like me, uh, last year, and you didn't know nothing about uh, data, so let's start with this, and you're going to be Improving. Well, that's where uh, it's all the code there is. And it's a work in progress. I'm learning because I'm a robotics engineer, and my goal is to combine the robotics with artificial intelligence. And so, if you are in this field, just talk to me, and and we'll be best friends. And the, my, my favorite combination is self-driving cars. So I hope that you could uh, build the self-driving cars just with uh, TensorFlow and using the basics that I have gave you, um, you're going to improve and improve and build the self-driving car. OK, thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Are there any questions? Please raise your hand. Um, thank you. Can you uh, show that previous slide with the uh, repository, please? Again, our the previous one? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi there, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, how, how much data do we actually need to do a decent training? I mean, training is really dependent on what you have and how you can build it. How much data should we feed it to provide something useful, if there is any clear answer on that? How much data you, yeah, do how I much, need? How much of the training process would we have to do up to the point that's actually something useful rather than just a simple algorithm? So how much data do I need to, to make something useful? Yeah, so if, if there is any guideline, that, yeah. You're going to need uh, tons of data. It depends on the application. But, um, well, there's a cool graph that, in which you see that machine learning, machine learning uh, algorithms works uh, w way better than the deep learning algorithms when you have uh, small data. When you have tons of data like terabytes of data for images, terabytes of data for sound, then deep learning is way better than machine learning, and it's going to do uh, impressive things. Uh, yeah, good. thanks for the incredible talk. Um, I wanted to ask uh, whether you have any comments about comparing TensorFlow to Theano, for example. Uh, that's one question, uh, and the next one is: There are so many meta libraries which built on top of TensorFlow, like Keras or something, which provide people with an easier interface uh, to, to sort of do a regression. 
would you comment on when to use TensorFlow versus uh, such a meta library like Keras? Uh, wait, uh, can you please take the microphone farther? Uh, well, uh, not audible, uh, sorry. So that, the first one was, um, uh, how would you compare TensorFlow to Tiano? Uh, do you know Tiano? It was, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I haven't worked with Tiano, but um, well, they say that Tiano is more, well, you can be, it's more low level, so you can be more creative, it's okay. more like, um, yes, yeah, more low level, it's, mu okay. it's much for scientists. Maybe let me ask you this, what made you make this presentation as an introduction to TensorFlow and not an introduction to Tiano? What? What, what made this presentation an introduction to TensorFlow versus an introduction to something else? Like, what made you choose TensorFlow over the other, other things? I can't understand what's the question. N never mind, it, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, because it's cool. <laughs> it's, it's from Google and, and, well, Google maintains, maintains mm, great yeah, their projects. Anybody else? This question? Nope? Okay. So, thank you again very much.